Hey there, I didn't see you. Just enjoying one of my banana muffins. Told you I was gonna make them. Well, welcome to the first online biology class. As with any biology class, we're gonna start with our silent do now. I will now sit here awkwardly for five silent minutes. Just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead and take out your biology notebooks though. You forgot. You forgot, didn't you, that you had a biology notebook. Please pause this video and go find it. We will start when you return. Now that you have your bio notebook, you're gonna to wanna to turn to page 106. This is the last page that we took notes on. It should have been on the five forces or the five fingers of evolution. We're looking at five different ways that populations could evolve, not just based on natural selection. This video is gonna be mostly focused on reviewing those, going in a little more detail and seeing them in a slightly different light. So if you feel confident with them, you can move on to the next video. If you would like a quick recap, because it has been two weeks, go ahead and watch through to the end. All right, students. So if you turn to page 106, you should have found that you're at the five forces of evolution. We had traced our beautiful hands. We passed elementary school. And we had our five different forces or mechanics that could actually cause a population to evolve. Small populations, gene flower migration, mutations, sexual selection, and natural selection. What I wanna do in this video is just kinda of clarify a little bit more about what each of these meant and give you guys a couple new vocabulary words. So let's go on over to page 107, or if you have room, you can keep adding this on to the top of page 106, up to you. First vocabulary word that I think we should introduce should be the idea of microevolution. Now, based on the name alone, you can probably figure out that micro is going to mean something small. And in these terms, microevolution is going to be defined as being changes in gene frequencies of a population. What exactly do I mean by that? We're going to see a visual example in just a second. Okay. One last vocabulary word that I want to clarify before we move into a visual example is the idea of a gene pool. Let's go ahead and put a term down for gene pool right now, but let's see the visual example first before we put down a definition. Before I move on, I do want to emphasize that gene pool and microevolution are completely intertwined because whenever the gene frequencies change, that is going to be reflected in your gene pool. Keep an eye out for this as I keep explaining. All right, so this is just an example page for you guys to look up. We're talking, remember, about those five forces of evolution. Evolution, remember, is not the evolution of an individual in his lifetime, but more about the evolution of a population so that the entire population changes over generations and generations. To help us explain this, we are gonna take a look at my friends, the gummy bears. Feel free to grab something else from your house if you would like to follow along. So let's say that we have a bunch of gummy bears living happily in a population. There are some red gummy bears, and then there's going to be their friends. Ooh, that does not show up well. Let's go for the white gummy bears, okay? We can see very clearly that these gummy bears are the same size, probably not the same flavor. Really, the one defining phenotypic difference between them is their color, though. Red versus our white yellow gummy bears. Now, we know that genes determine our physical characteristics. So if I was to look at these gummy bears closely, I could say maybe that the dominant gene, big R, was gonna give me a red gummy coat, whereas little r would have been what gave me my white, oh, fine, they look yellow, we'll call them yellow, my yellow gummy coat, okay? That means as I'm looking at these population, I probably noticed that I have an individual who's maybe homozygous dominant for, I just messed that up, homozygous dominant for our big R allele. Same thing with this guy and so on and so forth. Remember that each of these guys have two copies of one gene coding for fur color. That's because they get one copy from mom and one from dad. Reason why I'm labeling all of their alleles is what microevolutionists talk about when they're talking about a gene pool is if we took all of those individuals away and just looked at the alleles that were remaining, I would call this my hypothetical gene pool, okay? 
It's just a count of the number of different alleles dominant or recessive within one population of individuals. So if we want to write down our definition for that, we would say a gene pool is going to be my total number of genes from all the individuals in a population. So just like I counted up all of the R alleles, R genes, for a coat color in my gummy bear population, and called that my gene pool, you could do that for any type of genes within that gummy bear population. Okay. In general, a large gene pool means that your population is going to be stable. That's a good thing. They have a higher chance of survival. A small gene pool means that your population is unstable and is more likely to involve. We're going to see why in just a second. All right, now we get into the idea of how and why can we cause these genes to change so that the population evolves. These are going to be our five fingers. Finger number one was the idea of having a small population. The idea was the smaller the population is, the more likely it is to evolve. Remind yourself that in the original gene pool, pool we had four big R dominant allele genes and we had 10 little r recessive genes. Now say natural disaster strikes. For whatever reason, apparently it hits this side of the island. Poor gummy bears, sorry delicious they are. The remaining gummy bears get together, mourn their losses, and then start to reproduce. So let's say that for every gummy bear we have here, they've reproduced one of their kind. Okay, this would be our second generation. Now as I start to look at this population again, and if I was to count up the number of genes that I had for each one, roughly, we would realize that there's now going to be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 12 dominant alleles, and only 2, 4, 6, 8 recessive alleles in the population. Okay. I could wait a couple more generations, maybe a couple of them don't all reproduce, and as time goes on, I'm going to realize, as I double my population for a second generation, that this population is shifting. It's starting to shift more towards that dominant red coat allele versus the recessive yellow coat allele. And this is what I would term as the population evolving. Specifically, when this happens in small populations, I'm going to call this genetic drift. Now, when you're thinking drift, you're thinking of like a car drifting towards one side or the other, yeah? Same idea. You're thinking here in genetic drift that all of the genes are shifting towards one side, either the dominant ones or the recessive ones. For example, in our example, we can tell we're definitely shifting towards dominant R versus recessive R. There were two ways that this can happen to get a smaller population. The first one was the idea that a natural disaster or maybe disease or some sort of random chance event is going to wipe out your population. It doesn't discriminate or select only the red ones or only the yellow ones. Instead, it's perfectly random. It just happens to hit a certain section of the population. Okay. That is going to be called the bottleneck effect. The idea being that your poor population got poured out of a bottle and just a random amount of them were left over to reproduce. Okay. The second way that you can get a small population is called the founder effect. The idea behind this is, once again, a small random group of the population is going to leave and found its own population. What this might look like for our gummy bears, I'll show you in a second. If you'd like to add on notes to page 104, you can. If you feel comfortable with this, just keep watching. So in the founder effect, we're going to see something like, yay, yellow gummy bears decide one day to go leave, float on down the river, and make their own population over here. 
on their own island. What we're going to notice quite quickly is compared to the original population that had a fairly even spread of Rs, we're now going to have a population 1 that's going to have mostly, if not all, recessive Rs, yellow coats, and we're going to have population 2 over here that's going to quickly drift towards the big R coats. That would be an example of the founder effect. Moving on to the second finger, or gene flow. Gene flow is a fancy name for migration. As you can expect, it's the idea of genes flowing, moving, to a new place. So let's take a look at our original population again with our five red gummy bears and our four yellow gummy bears. And let's say this time, as they're living their happy life on Paper Island, several new gummy bears from neighboring islands float on over and migrate to join this population. Oh my goodness, but what do we notice about the new gummy bears? Clearly, the new gummy bears brought in quite a few new genes that were mostly recessive. And in doing so, they're going to shift the population gene pool so that it favors the recessives. If we're gonna double count, we're gonna see two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. 12 dominant red coat gummy bears and two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 13, 14. <laughs> two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. 18 recessive yellow coat gummy bears. What we're seeing is still called, considered evolution because over time as this population keeps reproducing, we're gonna notice that they're going to start to favor the yellow coat gummy bears more than the red coat gummy bears. And that's just due to the addition of the yellow coat gummy bears or those new genes from a different population. So gene flow could be better described as being addition of new genes from a new population into the existing population. Back on paper island for finger number three or mutations. This is another way to change up the gene pool, but this time by introducing brand new genes into the population. So say your population is pretty stable, he stays like this. Some gummy bears get together, uh -huh, having fun, and they produce new gummy bears. However, we will notice that one of their babies does not resemble the other gummy bears. In fact, this poor guy right here has a mutation that introduces a new set of genes into the population. Perhaps I will call his coat color Gigi. And what we will realize as Gigi goes out into the population, some gummy bears die off, they're all gonna get together, they're gonna have more babies. What we'll start to notice over time is that there will be a more and more Gs into, introduced into the population. This is normally true if the mutation is favorable. It's also potential that the mutation would be harmful or lethal and poor Gigi wouldn't even get a chance to survive and reproduce. But for the sake of this example, let's pretend that he can. Okay. What I'll notice over time in is that instead of having just dominant and recessive, I now have a third allele for a third coat color. And that is going to shift overall what my population looks like. So we will call him being... We've got six Gs in this population, two, four, six, eight, ten. We've got ten dominants, and two, four, six, we've got six recessives. Okay? Welcome back, guys, to finger number four. Can't do that with my fingers. Sexual selection, or a fourth way that you have your population slash their gene pool change. This one is based on the mating habits of the organisms on your island. So basically, the idea is, as they're walking around looking for mates, certain physical characteristics stand out to them and are more appealing than others. Let's say in this instance that red coats are extremely attractive to gummy bears. For some reason, they are the hot item in breeding season. In that case, every single red gummy bear will definitely get a mate. However, some lonely yellow gummy bears might not. Sorry. What we're going to realize then is that as these gummy bears go on to produce their offspring for the next generation, I'm going to see more and more and more red coats being produced. 
just because that's a dominant gene and they were also sexually selected for in the next generation. So my new generation, once I get rid of all my parents, might eventually end up looking like this. Due to pure sexual selection or choosing who you actually want to mate and have babies with, I can change my gene pool quite drastically. Since I have so many red coats in the new population, let's count them up, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, I've got 12 dominant alleles, and I've only got two, four dominant alleles. You can see how this population is going to quickly evolve or shift their gene pool, so that we probably will end up with a mostly red coat population by the next generation. And there y'all, we're almost there. We're moving on to finger number five, the last finger. This one's gonna be natural selection, which we've reviewed, and I feel pretty confident that you know. I'm changing up the coat colors just a little bit because eh, gotta work with what I have. Here we go. So let's say that on Paper Island, humans have stopped polluting the earth. Unfortunately, Paper Island turns a beautiful, beautiful shade of green. If these happy gummy bears are now wandering around, an unwitting predator will quickly circle the gummy bears and pick out the ones who are most obvious to them. Mm, yum, 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 yum. Gummy delicious. As a result, the poor red coats are quickly selected against, leaving the green ones to survive and reproduce in the next generation. Do take a look on the fact that I did not allow all of the red gummy bears to die off, that's because natural selection is never going to be perfect and there will most likely always be a couple of those less fit organisms left on your island. As I look now at my new generation, I'm going to notice that there's way more fit green gummy bears, the ones who are able to camouflage, survive, and reproduce well, compared to my poor red gummy bears. If I was to go into another generation, once again, predator prefers to eat the ones that he can see well, I might quickly select down to where I'm seeing almost all entirely green gummy bears who are then going to survive and reproduce. Natural selection in a gummy bear nutshell. Y'all, that's about it for this short video today. Remember to update in or around any of your fingers if you need to. Don't forget our two new words of the day, the idea of microevolution, or when you see changes in gene frequencies in a population, that means the population is evolving. Gene pool is going to be that total number of genes, and remember we're keeping track of the total number of genes to see if the population was evolving or not. Okay. If you have any questions, come see me in office hours. I will be more than happy to explain this one more time. And that's it for today, guys. Don't forget the five forces of evolution. We've got small populations, of which is the bottleneck effect and founder effect. Then we have gene flow, or the idea of migration, or adding new genes to the population. Next up, we have mutations, the idea that you can introduce brand new genes just based on changes in DNA, random changes in DNA. Then we have sexual selection, the idea that individuals with certain physical traits are going to be more likely to find a mate and reproduce, therefore passing on those traits. And finally, we have natural selection, the idea that the environment is going to pressure certain individuals so that they have a better opportunity of surviving and reproducing and passing on their traits to the next generation. I will see you guys in the next video.